You are listening to the Star Lores Podcast. I find your lack of faith disturbing. Why you stuck up, half-witted, scruffy-looking nerf herder? But I was going into Toshi Station to pick up some power converters. Scent of the dragon. A dark shadow skirts the edges of the force. A charade reflecting on his feelings. Tatooine is a harsh world. Whether playing hollow chess with a Wookiee at Chalman's Cantina, bargaining with Jawas for exploding astromech droids, or surviving in the Dune Sea, Danger is ever present. Twin suns scorch the ground, and a black sun haunts the dusty settlements. Even the notorious Zerka Corporation, able to turn a profit in virtually every other corner of the galaxy, pulled up stakes after briefly trying to establish a mining industry. The Saurian Dewback is obstinate enough to thrive in the oven-like temperatures of the day as well as the frigid evenings. One of a handful of off-world creatures to do well here is of course the enigmatic and terrifying Sarlacc. But the undisputed king of the desert is the Crate Dragon. The only exposure most Tatooinians have to the rare dragons are their remains. Occasionally, When the wind is right, dunes will move, revealing a spinal column dozens of meters long. The skull is lined with dozens of incisive teeth for capturing and killing any being fool enough to travel the desert wastes. Most of these lizards live in canyons and hence are classified as canyon crates. There is another species called the greater crate that lives in the dune sea These enigmatic creatures have ten pairs of legs, which they use to swim through sand, and elongated necks in comparison to their canyon-dwelling cousins. Crates are known to live for up to a century, and their physical prowess and hunting abilities are retained throughout their lifespan. For this reason, the Jedi of old christen the Cheyenne and Gem So forms the way of the dragon in honor of the indomitable beast. They are force sensitive creatures and are attracted to nexuses of the dark side. As mysterious as the dragons of Tatooine are, the indigenous sand people for whom the crate plays a central role in coming of age rituals. One of the few pieces of literature translated from the Tuscan language to basic concerns this ritual. From the womb of the crate, be blessed with rebirth. You are her killer and her child, a greater dragon than she. Pull from her belly your prize and her apology. Along with Jawas, sand people are the only native sentients of Tatooine, having occupied the world continuously for tens of thousands of years. Tatooine has been settled and later abandoned numerous times by the galactic community. The harsh environment and relative lack of natural resources and valuable minerals has caused the world to be relatively poverty-stricken. Moisture farming, pod racing, and organized crime have been the only successful industries on the world. The stable off-world population has always been modest with many of its citizens wishing for any way to escape the Dust Ball. After a tribe of sand people attacked a settlement called Fort Tuscan in 85 BBY, Tuscan Raider became an alternate name for them, according to settlers. Tuscans have thrived on Tatooine for millennia. Their culture is ancient. 
the stories of their land and ancestors are whispered on the desert wind in ways that no core world transplant could ever know. Tuscans herd the mighty Bantha. They are used as mounts for sustenance and for companionship. Riders form a deep bond with the woolly pachyderms. When a Bantha rider's mount dies, he wanders in the desert until he finds another one, the first of two known exile conditions amongst Tuscan clans. Sand people are virtually never seen without their distinctive robes and head wraps. It is considered a grave sin for the sun to touch their skin, or for others to see them outside of their traditional garb. Their traditional weapon is the gadderfi, a kind of mace used to maul enemies and finish off wounded prey. Additionally, many are armed with slug throwers. Tuscans can be excellent shots, capable of hitting a pod racer traveling in excess of 300 kilometers an hour at a distance of several hundred meters. Although an incredibly rare sight, some sand people have been seen without their robes and masks. They have feline snouts and a grayish skin tone, but otherwise have an anthropoid appearance. Although their culture is highly conservative and insular, and they generally kill outsiders on sight, there are exceptions. The infamous Jedi Knight Revan, for example, was known to have been on friendly terms with one Tuscan tribe during the Old Republic era. They were also known to adopt the orphaned children of settlers they killed in raids. In some cases, this may have been an upgrade in class, as slavery has been endemic among the settlers of Tatooine throughout its history. One such orphaned human slave was named Kashyyyk. Although Tuscans saw no distinction between themselves and those they adopted, irrespective of species, Kashyyyk may have been lonely as the one human in her clan. After his family died in an accident, the prestigious Jedi Knight Sherad Het emigrated to Tatooine. In his disillusionment with the Jedi Order and the violence of the galactic community, he wanted to live somewhere totally separate from his previous life. Eventually, he too joined a Tuscan clan, but only after pro proving his value through combat. In time, he became a war leader of many tribes. He warred against other Tuscans as well as on encroaching settlers. At some point, he met Kashyyyk and the two were married. The relationship bore a son who they named Asherad, adding the glottal stop suffix that permeated Tuscan language to Sherad's name. After giving birth, Kashyyyk disappeared, a mystery which has never been solved. Asherad was raised no different from any other Tuscan, despite his being human and a powerful force sensitive. Wearing his robes with Gadderfi in hand, he was a Tuscan. When tensions between Tuscans and settlers were spurred by Jabba the Hutt's arms dealing scheme, Sherad the war leader put his domestic duties on hold and fought back. His goal in doing so was to minimize collateral. Even so, hollow footage of a lightsaber-wielding Tuscan raider reached Corazont. Master Kiadi Mundi was dispatched to retrieve the mysterious rogue. After meeting, Mundi was unable to convince Het to abandon his duties as war leader and return to the Jedi Temple. Shortly after their meeting, Sherad fought a skirmish against a mercenary band hired by one faction of settlers. Aura Singh, the dark Jedi and assassin, slew Sherad in the melee, orphaning Asherad. As Sherad had requested, Master Mundi then took Asherad on as a Padawan learner. For the first time, the young boy left the desert, 
though he would wear the traditional sand person clothing for many decades. Considering the circumstances of his birth, Asherad for many years believed that he was half Tuscan. When he had access to detailed biological information on Corazon, however, he learned that such human Tuscan hybrids were biologically impossible, and so his mother must have been human. Despite this, he resolved whatever identity crisis the revelation may have caused, and continued to identify as Tuscan. By the outbreak of the Clone Wars, Asherad had completed his training under Master Mundi. He had also taken on a Nikto Padawan named Bot Jewel. Like his master, Jewel came from a desert world and a culture that highly prized martial prowess, and the two formed a close bond. Like many of his Jedi comrades, Het became a distinguished general in the hellfire of war. His charismatic leadership style also came to the fore, and it was here that he began to learn how to inspire unswerving loyalty in those under his command. At the Battle of Jabim, Jedi Knight Obi-Wan Kenobi went missing and was presumed killed in action. His apprentice, Anakin Skywalker, was deeply affected by the death of the closest person he had to a brother. Het began to mentor him during this time, though considering Anakin's feelings of guilt and rage towards Sand People, it was a difficult relationship. At that time, Het was, as far as anybody knew, a Tuscan. Anakin, Asherad, and Bat were deployed on a mission to the desert world of Argonar. In a skirmish there, Bat Jewel was killed. The remaining Jedi had been separated from Republic forces and had to contend with Argonar's harsh environment. In a skirmish against Confederate soldiers, Anakin began to hallucinate. He saw his enemies as sand people and attacked them with the same hate he used to wipe out an entire clan on Tatooine months earlier. The hallucination extended to Het and he attacked his comrade. Asherad was able to de-escalate the marauding Anakin by removing his mask and revealing his humanity. Anakin confessed to his crime against sentience, and Het vowed to keep the secret, believing that justice was only possible if Anakin came to terms with his guilt on his own. Het kept his word, and Anakin was eventually reunited with Obi-Wan. When Order 66 was given at the end of the Clone Wars, Het was one of a handful of Jedi who escaped the treachery. Like his father before him, he went to Tatooine and joined a Tusken clan, quickly becoming a war leader. When his war band set its sights on attacking the Lars homestead, fellow Jedi exile Obi-Wan Kenobi intervened and the two fought a vicious lightsaber duel on the Great Chot Salt Flat. Obi-Wan vanquished Het using his favorite technique, dismemberment. Having lost his dominant arm, and thus his ability to wield a gadderfi, Het was exiled from his clan. The Eyes of Horror To understand us, there is one place to start. Let me introduce you to the embrace of pain. Quote, Shadow Shai After being exiled, Het took to the stars to become a bounty hunter. During this time, he learned of Anakin and Chancellor Palpatine's central roles in the Jedi Purge. For the first time, he forsook his Jedi vows as he swore vengeance on the Dark Lords of the Sith and their galactic empire. Later, Het pursued an acquisition to the remote and uninhabited world of Moraband in the Astran Sector. 
Being a learned man, however, he saw through the Emperor's clumsy attempt at suppressing history, renaming the planet. He had actually come to Korriban, Cradle of the Sith. Many ghosts have, and likely still do, wander the arid wasteland of Korriban. Several specters of the Twelve Dark Jedi to survive the Hundred Years' Darkness have been known to haunt galactic history long after their mortal deaths, such as Agenta Paul, Karnes Muir, Sorzis Zin, and Zozan. Several of them were interred in massive tombs in the Valley of the Dark Lords. Zozan, in particular, was restless in her afterlife. In life, Zozan led the Black Legions in battle against the Jedi until their destruction at the Battle of Corbos. In death, she waited for aeons until one strong enough to enact her vengeance on the Jedi answered her call to learn her dark secrets and unleash chaos on the galaxy once again. Asherad Het heard that call through the Force and traced its source to Zhojan's tomb. Het roleplayed as the Sith acolyte to Zhojan, but in his heart retained his Jedi ideals. He simply believed that the dark side knowledge she held was the only way that he could possibly defeat Darth Sidious and Vader, freeing the galaxy from their cruel chokehold. The dark side was simply a means to an end. In time, Asherad learned all he could from his master, and she was already dead, precluding the need to slay her as with the Sith tradition. Upon leaving Korriban to claim vengeance, he was horrified to learn that it had eluded him. Sidious and Vader were dead. They had been for decades. Disillusioned and without purpose, Asherad fled to the unknown regions to lose himself. Fear of the unknown, it has been said, is the oldest and deepest kind. Asherad would learn in a very personal way what shape that fear could take. The Yazan Vong had, by Asherad's self-imposed exile, begun deploying scout ships to the galaxy far, far away, in preparation for an invasion. The embrace of pain was an important religious and meditative practice in Vong society. Embracing other species was considered sacrilegious by some of their priesthood. Asherad's fellow fallen Jedi, Vergir, cared nothing for Vong religious practices, however. When the scout ship she was in command of captured Het, she had him restrained upside down and naked in the biotechnological rack that was the Embrace of Pain. Like many elements of Vong biotech, the Embrace had an independent nervous system and a kind of consciousness. It would read the neurophysiological outputs of a victim's brain in order to determine and apply the most painful stimuli imaginable. While embraced, Het's ligaments were stretched to the point of rupture his skin was burned with acid. He was electrocuted, pierced with thorns, jabbed with needles, and biotoxins were administered. One of his eyes was removed and replaced with a biologically analogous Vong eye. It was icy blue with a kind of two comma shaped iris. He was injected with Yorick Cool, a substance that infected the brains of Vong slaves and allowed them to be controlled by Vong commanders. The embrace of pain was highly sensitive monitor of biomedical data would always stop the torture before death and inject with nutrients and allow him to sleep long enough to heal so his agony could begin again. During the embrace, Vergeer initiated Het into a kind of graduate school for the dark side, teaching him to use pain to channel its power. In this process, the man was broken and in his brokenness had a spiritual awakening. All at once, he saw the teachings of Zhou Zhan, Vergeer, and the brutality of the Vong biology coalesce into a new path for followers of the dark side. In this moment of agony, he created the philosophy of the One Sith. Although he eventually escaped from the ship, his Yorick Kull infestation would remain a chronic illness that affected him for the remainder of his life. The condition's effects were twofold. First, it would eventually strip him of his sentience. Secondly, Bony oak growths began to erupt from his body, slowly growing until he would become nothing but an immobile fleshy growth medium for the alien coral. Het returned to Korriban, a changed man, submerged fully in the dark side. There he assumed the mantle of Darth Krait, declared himself Dreadlord, 
and once more discarded his past identity. In the Shadow of Power. Crate's worldview, reflecting his name, was predatory. He believed that it was the role of the strong to shatter and consume the weak. Despite this violent outlook, the goal of his fledgling one Sith was actually to bring a lasting peace to the galaxy. He did not want what followers of Darth Bane's rule of two Sith did, that is, power for its own sake. His disciples would be devoted to one shared goal, rather their own selfish desires. Devotion to the dark side was only important insofar as it was, according to Kraid, the stronger force alignment, and only the strongest could ensure the peace he claimed to seek. The phantoms of previous Sith Lords, including Darth Nihilus and Bane, for their part, did not approve the reforms and scolded Crate for them. As he did when he first began learning from Zozan, Crate believed that the ends justified the means. If he had to kill trillions and wipe out entire species in order to establish galactic peace, then so be it. The ultimate goal, peace, was reflected to varying degrees in the organizational structure of the One Sith. In previous incarnations, the student would always kill the master, or else be killed in the attempt. In Crate's Sith, his apprentices served him, with no thought given to their own status or personal gain and no attempt to usurp the mantle of Dark Lord of the Sith would be made. With this internal structure, the chaos and infighting that prevented previous Sith empires from emerging victorious against the Jedi would be prevented. Many of the one Sith were trained from birth to serve Darth Krayt. These ones were somewhat prejudiced to those Sith who joined their masters later in life. In secret, Crate also developed Sith troopers. He kidnapped or seduced some of the most powerful force sensitives in the galaxy and melded them with machines. In effect, he created a private army of Darth Vaders. These vicious cyborgs could establish neural interfaces with their ships and were engineered for maximum combat efficiency. The colors black and red were retained as dominant visual motifs in the One Sith. Most of Krayt's disciples wielded red lightsabers, as Sith had done for millennia. After returning to Korriban, Krayt fashioned two new lightsabers, with hilts that bore a close resemblance to Vong Biotech, and may have made use of it in some way. Rather than sleek chrome with finely machined knobs and switches, they were an earthy gray-green and looked something between a bone and muscle with asymmetric curves and arches throughout the structure. His acolytes built their weapons in a similar style and dressed in black robes or donned black armor. Most of the one Sith opted for extensive black tattoos covering their faces, torsos, and extremities in the traditional style. Making further use of Vong methods, Krayt obtained his own embrace of pain. With it, he trained lieutenants such as Darth Neil in the same way as Vergeer taught him. Suffering brought them closer to the dark side, more able to wield it effectively, and perhaps more pliable to Krayt's will. He would also use it to torture enemy prisoners of war, such as Delia Blue, 
The callous and cruel treatment of sentience was an ancient Sith tradition that the one Sith retained. After declaring himself Dread Lord of the Sith, Krait set about aggressive recruitment efforts. He attempted to recruit Sith Lady Lumia, but she had her own views on how Sith should behave in the galaxy. One of his earliest and most trusted disciples was Darth Wireluk, the first who achieved the rank of Voice, second in command of the One Sith. This man's son and grandson would inherit the Wirelock title and rank when their predecessor died. Of prime importance in the Wirelock duty roster was keeping the Dreadlord alive in stasis when his slave seed infestation began to progress at a rate that would kill him before achieving galactic domination. Wirelock would then serve as the de facto leader of the One Sith, carrying out his will in absentia. All Wirelocks were skilled in medicine, a rare trait among the Sith. It was Wirelock III who learned the most about the healing arts, as by his time, in about 137 ABY, Krait's condition was deteriorating quickly. He sought the same answers that Sith had searched for since the Second Great Schism, immortality. He looted tomb after tomb, read countless scrolls and leather-bound tomes, and learned terrible secrets from long-forgotten holocrons. All the knowledge he acquired was in vain, as none of the old alchemical methods could cure Krait's illness. At one point, he resurrected the immortal god-king, Prakith, also known as Darth and Didu. The undead king showed no gratitude to Warlock for bringing him back to the world of the living, and refused to offer up his secrets. Sick of his games, Warlock slew the reborn king with fearful dark side illusions. Mega Red. The galaxy must experience the pain of death and rapture, of rebirth as I have. I will bring chaos. It is time for war. Quote Darth Krait. There were three other notable Darths, apart from Warlock. They are extensions of the body and will of their dread lord. Talon, the red-skinned Lethan Twi'lek, used her dancer's grace and sexuality to great effect, seducing Jedi Knights to the dark side, as well as performing infiltration missions and assassinations. She eventually achieved the rank of Hand, the highest honor for an assassin in the One Sith. Darth Nil, a former Nagai warlord, was one of the foremost combatants in the One Sith, and eventually attained the rank of Fist. History best remembers him as the commander at the massacre at Osis, in which the Jedi Order was once more shattered. He personally killed Cole Skywalker, among other prominent knights during the attack. His tattoos were different from the other Sith. They played off of his naturally bleach white skin and involved large portions of it tattooed solid black rather than the jagged spidery tattoos more common in the organization. His lightsaber was also unique. It was a kind of claymore with an enormous hilt and proportionally long blade. Bull Isen, though not a Darth, was a trained user of the dark side and was competent with the lightsaber. Despite not being marked with black tribal markings over his given exoskeleton, nor being a part of Krat's internal body, he was the deadliest of Krat's lieutenants. He would go down in infamy as the Butcher of Dak, and successfully deployed a biological engineered weapon on the ocean world. The Alliance managed to evacuate a small portion of Dak prior to the attack, but the Quarren and Malkal populations were decimated, narrowly escaping the intended genocide. 
Eisen was very much a military being and scientist. He preferred to dress in the fashion of an imperial military officer rather than the black robes of the one Sith. He worked in the Omega Red Bioweapon, which, if deployed, would have wiped out all non-Sith sentient life on Coruscant. Darth Malady was a talented scientist, but like many of Crate's followers, she used her talents for violence and murder. She was a rare Deveronian female who left her homeworld of Deveron, though this was not her choice. When she was a child, Crate murdered her parents and then took her under his wing. She went on to become one of his most important servants. Like Isen and Nil, she too committed crimes against sentience, and perhaps also against nature. Prior to 127 ABY, the Jedi were working closely with reformed Vong to restore the ecosystems of worlds ravaged by the Vong shaping of decades prior. After recruiting the rogue Vong shaper, Zenok Kwa, Maladi succeeded in sabotaging these efforts, and the affected ecosystems remained dead. Towards the collapse of the one Sith-controlled galactic empire, Maladi was captured by Ronfell's Imperial Knights and psychologically decompensated. Despite a severe mental illness, she was still able to put the finishing touches on Omega Red. Emperor Fell nearly released this nightmarish weapon into the population of occupied Coruscant. Were it deployment successful, this would have been one of the deadliest uses of bioweapons ever recorded in galactic history. 130 ABY marked the final stage of Darth Krayt's strategy for galactic domination, and thus peace. The one Sith deposed the Emperor of the Galactic Empire, Rhone Fell. While occupying Fell's throne, Krayt renovated the Jedi Temple according to the prevailing Sith aesthetics, and constructed a massive statue of his favorite teacher, Zhou Zhan, in the plaza. What followed was the brutal civil war of Fell Loyalists versus the Throne Loyalists, who served Darth Krayt and his minions. Admiral Gar Stasi of the Broken and Battered Galactic Alliance also entered the fray, eventually turning to the tide of the war in Fell's favor. During the war, Krayt finally discovered a cure for his sickness. Cade Skywalker, descendant of the legendary founder of the New Jedi Order, was gifted with a rare dark side power. He was instinctively able to use Dark Transfer, an ability that allowed him to heal virtually any injury or illness, no matter how grave, including the Yorick Cole infestation which plagued Crane. Though certainly not a Jedi, Cade had no interest in helping Crane, and so Crane tried to woo and tempt Skywalker, as so many Sith have done to powerful Force sensitives. He came close, but Cade never fully joined the Sith. Eventually, the two fought at Had Abaddon. Crate lost the battle, but survived. Barely clinging to life, he turned to his most trusted servant. Rather than aid his master, Darth Warlock electrocuted him with forced lightning. Believing him dead, Warlock put Crate's body back in stasis and assumed regency of the Galactic Empire. Like the dragon of his namesake, Crate was more difficult to kill. He survived and somehow learned the dark transfer ability, using it to heal himself of the wounds from the battle and from his Vong sickness. Reborn, he returned to Coruscant, killed Warlock, and dueled Skywalker again. History repeated itself. Skywalker stabbed Krayt in the chest with his lightsaber, then flew the Dread Lord's body into Coruscant Prime, the local star, preventing a second rebirth. Hey folks, thanks for listening to this episode of the Star Lores Podcast. First of all, I want to thank all of our patrons for helping us to make the show. And a big shout out to our newest patron, Alex. All the proceeds go towards marketing and fees we need to pay to make the highest quality podcast possible. Also, don't forget to give us a five-star rating and review on iTunes, as well as subscribe on your podcatcher app so you don't miss any episodes. We are also on YouTube, so make sure to hit the like and subscribe button. 
You can find our socials on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just search the Star Wars podcast on any of those platforms and send us a DM. We love to hear from our listeners, be they suggestions, what topics you would like to hear covered in the future, and what you are enjoying about the show. Also, if you have any Star Wars content, be it art, music, short stories, toy collections, cosplay, or bookshelves, feel free to show it to us, and we may even feature it on one of our social media posts, or even the show itself. We love that kind of stuff. Okay, I think I hear the Millennial Falcon dropping out of hyperspace. Let's get back into the show. Welcome aboard the Millennial Falcon. You guys have your sunglasses and sunscreen on. Corazon Prime is real bright. I have a uh, Yezong Vong artificially <laughs> enhanced eyes. Ah, I see. <laughs> They're essentially just spikes driven through each each eye. That's, right. that's that's what a Vong eye is. It's just a <laughs> spike driven through, through the your... back of your skull <laughs> that pops out your eye socket. By the way, uh, I don't know if anybody has noticed, but the episodes that are dropping in October are mostly very spooky in, in theme. We started out with Sith species, Darksiders, Darth Crate, and the One Sith. And uh, we'll see where it goes from we'll there. We'll see where it yeah. goes from there. Does this mean we're doing a Star Wars Christmas special? For <laughs> 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 I think that's what that means, that yes. That is the finale, <laughs> the bonus episode dropped when we get to 31st. December. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Darth Crate at one point fans sort of thought it, he might have been revealed as Jason Solo and there was like this fan contest for naming Jason Solo. It was called the Darth Who contest. So he ended up being named Darth Cadus by fans, which which is interesting that even all the way back then that must have been like 2000 seven or something around there yeah early early o's the early aughts uh lucas arts was sort of allowing the mob to write (laughs) their their material (laughs) as they've continued to do (laughs) yeah they'd have a might have a Bodie McBoat face situation (laughs) coming up pretty quick (laughs) (laughs) it couldn't be worse uh Speaking of things that Disney screwed up, <laughs> this really broke my heart when I learned of it in the research for this episode. <coughs> is there was supposed to be a Darth Maul centric video game oh, really? released in it, it went into pre production in 2011. So then, obviously, when Disney acquired Star Wars, they they, binned it. they yeah. tabled it. And in that game, the antagonist, I assume he would have been like the final boss. <laughs> squeak squeak get that astromech <laughs> droid in here <laughs> i assume i assume uh asherod would have been the final boss or something you're against, guessing that against or? darth maul i'm guessing that it, it said he was like the primary antagonist oh, okay that would have been sweet a darth maul video game would have been epic yeah, yeah totally um the artificial skeleton of the crate dragon that you see C-3PO and R2 walking by in A New Hope. They went back to T- Tunisia to that same desert in filming Attack of the Clones and the skeleton was still there, which is Oh really? <laughs> oh really? <laughs> which is a, a cool a little, little story. People there. in the future Did the local so just like not <laughs> care about it or <laughs> Well, what locals? It's just a desert. Like nobody goes there. <laughs> it's I like the There's dis- the, the the thing about Africa is like it. <laughs> don't give me that look, Christian. Is huge huge swaths of it are just like uninhabitable. Yeah, yeah. it's like the surface of the moon, right? And that's yeah. sort of one of those places. Yeah, I I actually spent time in uh, Morocco in the desert there too in the Sahara, and things can be preserved surprisingly well in the desert because it's dry. I mean, that's why Egypt yeah. <laughs> is preserved so well, right? Yeah. There's not a lot of like macro microbacteria that will break things down and stuff. So things like, you know, prop movie props. Could, I also could assume the crate last. dragon skeleton wasn't biological. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> it's hard yeah. to decompose the plastic. Yeah, yeah so. <laughs> precisely. I thought it was a whale ske- skeleton. Could have been. Um, so there are a couple of interesting parallels between 
sort of Darth Crate and the Sand People and the Fremen from from <laughs> Dune. So this is your compare and contrast essay question on on the finals that you're having to write for at Star Wars University. Uh, so so what are the similarities between the Fremen and the Sand People? I've never actually read Dune, so I'm a bad So student. one <laughs> one thing is uh, their clothes. So the sand people in their culture, it's like totally unacceptable to ever not have their robes and their mask on. And that's because it's it's so hot and dry on Tatooine. It's just sort of a survival thing. And then in Dune, the Fremen and like anybody who leaves a house pretty much on the desert world of Arrakis has to don a still suit to preserve their moisture. So it's like the same idea. And wearing a still suit is very much part of the, a really important part of the Fremen world building. So that's a, a similarity there. Um, another thing is Paul Muad'Dib in Dune. He was like the main character, sort of the, the Luke Skywalker type of person. And he, like Crate, and like a lot of Jedi had the ability of prescience and foresight and he could like see the future. And so one of the things Paul Muad'Dib saw was that he would have to wage a bloody jihad across the galaxy. And then that's sort of exactly what we get from Crate Asherad Het, right? He does kind of the exact same thing that Paul Muad'Dib does. And furthermore, Paul Muad'Dib was not he was actually originally Paul Atreides. And so again, you have that identity play of starting out as one thing. Because, renaming yourself, rebirthing yourself. Yeah, yeah, because he wasn't a Fremen. He was an Atreides, right? A transplant there who was then accepted into this clan. And just, culture. Yeah. Just like the, the whole Sherrod Het thing. Although uh, Asherod was was born into the Tuscans, whereas... Yeah, you, could, you can split the character yeah. into two different characters. But yeah, I can see... The relationship for sure and um i i'm sort of i i tried to look up what a um uh a tuscan looks like underneath the mask and there isn't really any pictures that i could find there's an old video game i think it might have been a jedi like the first jedi knight game possibly where there are Tuscans without clothes, without their robes. And what did they, like, what did they They're look like? Basically, I mean, <laughs> just a lot of polygons, basically. Yeah, <laughs> because it's a very old thing. Well, I, I've seen, like, I, I found no, that's some, how like, they look. They look like polygons. <laughs> yeah. I found uh, fan depictions, and they were, like, very alien. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, their faces, uh, you know, like, like four big, you know, predator-like teeth. Um, yeah, I think... People took the Tuscan thing, yeah, it, as, assuming that it meant like. Well, well, it's interesting because he they had tusks, yeah, tusks, maybe. right? Yeah, and he sort of like thought he was half Tuscan, right? right. So, I, I was just like curious, like they must look similar enough to humans that it's like almost and, indistinguishable. But if not, he's a full human, yeah, he's I forget not that showing himself to other Tuscans either. That's like true. They wear their clothes, yeah. and that's why in a culture where you never see another face, you don't. I guess really so. Know. I think in the in the comic book where he does take off his mask, though, I think he might give some sort of explanation about the tattoos on his face, and that he he got the tattoos in sort of like homage. It's some sort of stylized depiction of a Tuscan face, right? Mm. But I mean, they just look like Mike Tyson's tattoos. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, they're not really. They don't look like anything. Yeah. There's also an old art book, too, in terms of the Tuscan face that showed, I believe, it had a lot about, like, Tatooine, and, like, I think it tried to show Jawas without their hoods on, and oh, okay. Tuscan Raiders, and I don't know if that book is canon. I read it in, like, grade four, but, like, the artwork is very, like, it's very good art. It's, mm -hmm. like, realistically drawn, and it's treated almost like someone, it's, it's taken from, like, a first world in-universe perspective of, like, some kind of... Um, biologist or someone studying tattooing is a really good book i wish i could dig it up somewhere but that also might be where some of the depictions and whether or not that book is even canon anymore who knows because that's even old by old star wars standards sounds so. like it might have been written by mammon hool <laughs> yeah that's what i was, I was like that was the idea to that, that trying yeah. to <laughs> give across so it was yeah, actually mammon hool yeah because <laughs> mammon in all seriousness in the legends mammon hool did 
uh, do a lot of field research on Tatooine. Yeah, it could, and it very well could have been like, like I said, I read this in grade four, so I don't hmm. remember who it was attributed to in universe and stuff. So another thing, sort of an out of universe thing, is in the second draft of A New Hope, Tusken Raiders were supposed to be like assassins from the Empire, and they they were just oh. human and they had red eyes and they hmm. drove around in land speeders. And the red eye thing is again like another. I almost think somebody told George to change that because it's sounding too much like Dune again. Because another important part of Dune is uh, the blue in blue eyes you get from being addicted to melange. <laughs> and so I, I assume that that's where that George was, was kind of <laughs> <laughs> taking off of that. That's uh, that's a possibility. Another thing is the exile that. Crate or Asherod at the time has because he can't wield a gaffy stick anymore because Obi Wan, <laughs> as he so want to do, cut off his arm. <laughs> and I also want to point out that this is like another genocidal maniac that Obi Wan had the, a chance to <laughs> to kill and didn't. let go. <laughs> Good Obi-Wan's job. Obi Wan's looking less and less like a saint every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's just a drunk. <laughs> That's. That's Obi-Wan. So anyway, can't hold his ga- gatter fee, so he gets exiled. And then at, I won't totally spoil it, but at a certain point, Paul Muad'Dib loses his eyesight and is also exiled from the Fremen for the same reason, because if you, can't, if you don't have your eyesight, you can't take care of yourself and resources are so scarce that if you can't take care of yourself... You're a burden. In the Fremen, you're a yeah. burden. You're yeah. done. Another similarity... <laughs> Is the greater crate dragon who's got those 10 legs, which is very cool. I like that because it's really breaking sort of the general biological plausibility form and and doing Four like a, a, tr- a truly alien creature, right? Yeah. We, we don't have mammals that have 10 legs. That's or not mammals, reptiles. Yeah, <laughs> I should say that have 10 legs, but also that it swims in the sea and that's like. The Shai Halud, the uh, the worm, the giant sandworms in um, Dune, yeah. Dune, and then also like Dune, the crate dragons give up these pearls, which are very valuable, and in Dune, the the sandworms give up their teeth. You can turn them into Chris knives, which are important things. And finally, <laughs> <laughs> the coming of age ritual. The blood rite, wherein you kill a what? A crate dragon. <laughs> and in Dune, to become a, a man in Fremen culture, you have to ride a sandworm, which is the same sort of uh, desert person's rite of passage. <laughs> and so that's my 10 point answer. <laughs> on full <laughs> marks, 100%. Full marks. Hooray. Uh, wh- one thing that, that's very Dune like that. Sherad had said at one point was on Tatooine, the very air and sunlight are one's enemies. That's like Dune. It's so dry that it's like you'll yeah. die of dehydration in minutes. Yeah. And it kind of like speaks to the, the way the culture develops there. Like if everything is so hostile, the people will become like hardened and have to like have a very survivor exactly. mentality, which incidentally Darth Crate adopts that like survivor mentality. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And he, he sort of sees the world through a hunter's eyes. Yeah, and, exactly. And yeah. that kind of thing. Uh, he had a lot of other adventures. Uh, Darth Crate did. Like he he teamed up with Luke to fight Abeloth at one point and just sort of did. Yeah. His, his character, you mentioned this earlier, is very. I mean, like, he lived like over a hundred years. Yeah. A lot of that was in stasis. So it's kind of like he wasn't alive, but yeah, but he still pops in and out. And during like pretty significant galactic events, like he was, he encounters Anakin Skywalker as a Padawan, right? He is around during the, the sequel era. He then in the grand Jedi tradition, <laughs> <laughs> let a murderous tyrant go. And then finally he does appear hundreds of years later at the very end of like, I do kind of like his, um, his, uh, Sith cult that he sort of developed. The one Sith. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, the but they're communist Sith. <laughs> they're they're like yeah, they they have a very kind of different divergent philosophy yeah. from especially diverging from the rule of two. You know? Yeah, I like that too because it 
kind of changes a little bit of like, well, you know, did the story conclude with Anakin and Vader and the story yeah. of the Sith? And instead of recycling the same, oh, another Sith ri- rises, right? This is at least something different. Yeah, and, and like whereas the the <coughs> older Sith were considered themselves above morality, Darth Krait is doing what he's doing in his head for the for, greater good, for a yeah, moral yeah. reason, yeah. right? Yeah, so that's a very interesting take on the dark side and everything, yeah. which I, I yeah, really he, appreciate. He just viewed it as a means to an end, right? Yeah. He believed that the means or the ends justified, justified the means. means. Yeah, I get a very strong Thanos vibe from him, actually. <laughs> yeah, it, it is kind of... He does kind of look like like he's got a strong chin. Let's not get carried away <laughs> with our comparisons. <laughs> yeah, so the death of Darth Krait, there's another... Uh, story arc in the legacy comic book run. We'll get to that eventually, I assume. But basically, this ends at 147 ABY, and that's sort of the end of the Star Wars Legends stories. This ended in like 2009, 2010. Yeah, it's the farthest forward into history that we've gotten to see with Star Wars Legends. And none of the novels, there were no novels written in that time period, right? It was just no. the legacy comic yeah. books. The legacy series, and then once legacy ended, part part two or book two of legacy, that's kind of all we get. And I'm sure there was room there for you could go anywhere with it still, but just because of after that, the Disney acquisition and stuff, it just kind of floated off into space. <laughs> like we're about to do. <laughs> All right. Got anything else, Jordan? Let's rev up those engines and hit the sun. <laughs> Oil that hyperdrive. <laughs> May the forks be with you. 